Hi guys, welcome to Turmeric and Tequila, where we are working to inspire a positive, radical social evolution. I'm so excited today. I am welcoming a very longtime friend and fellow fitness competitor, Carol Fabrizio, to the Turmeric and Tequila mic. She is a mom, leader, coach, speaker, strategist, advocate, and athlete, amongst so many other things. She has a deep solid resume in the corporate world and yet she leads with the heart and a very humanized perspective in all of her pursuits. It's a really fabulous conversation about leadership, leading yourself so you can lead others, core values, and basically just being an all-around varsity human. Phenomenal conversation if you're looking to get some personal coaching or if you're a person making to looking to make a leap from the corporate world into entrepreneurship, this is a combo for you. Carol, thank you so much for the time and energy. I cannot wait to see you in person soon. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Questioning a better way, one gracefully disruptive conversation at a time. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. I am so excited today. You know, I love my Connects of Connects, but I have a genuine longtime friend that I met through fitness. You know, fitness makes friends. And I always say how much I love lacrosse and CrossFit because it's the best filter for my varsity humans. So I'm bringing one of those varsity humans to the mic. Um, I think I've known her for like six, seven, eight years. Uh, a, a very, very long time. Carol Fabrizio, welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. 10 years? <laughs> In nine years nine, nine years. years yeah i joined front range in 2012 so we go way back oh shoot okay so we are fellow competitors um and it's i love i always say how people competed in, in lacrosse uh, obviously my collegiate sport but also then in crossfit post-collegiate situation I would say when, how people work out is kind of how they, they operate in life. So Carol mm-hmm. was a fellow competitor and she was a go hard gangster in the gym. So it's no surprise that her outside world, um, was the same competitive situation. So we're going to be talking about her business today. Some sports and athletics will obviously infiltrate the conversation, but I just want to intro her. And then as you know, in Turmeric and Tequila, I let these varsity humans share, uh, their ethos from their, their point of view. So here is her she started, started a new coaching business, which obviously we're going to unpack, but this is quite literally her about me. She says, I'm a mom, leader, coach, speaker, strategist, advocate, and athlete. My mission is to help individuals and organizations consciously decide who they want to become and then help them design the process to make that transformation happen. I deeply value courage, learning, leadership, and joy, which is exactly what it takes to step into a new way of, of leading a new career or a new life. You can change how you lead. You can change your life. I can help. And I read that first strategically because I, when I read it, I, I so loved that she didn't lead with these deep career ethos. And I'm going to tell you those now because they're they're deeply impressive. Um, she's an attorney. She, an attorney. She spent eight years with Vail Resorts, uh, ending up being the vice president of communications and marketing operations. She was the chief communications and marketing officer for USA Gymnastics, and not to mention, like she said, a mom, a wife, and uh, a competitor in the field. So. I just love, and I have to give you a nod, and we talked about this before I got on the mic, how amazing it was that you led with this very human angle of your business and your heart when you have all these incredible ethos. So I'm just giving you a gold star yeah. from Kristen Olson. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kristen. I so appreciate that. I I have this, uh, it's like something stuck in my craw about how you know we we think of ourselves and we should think of ourselves as so much more than just what we've done. And yet every time you're asked to write a bio, it usually starts with, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, and I accomplished this and got this piece of paper. So I just wanted to have it be a little bit more like, hey, what are the words that identify me? So the first sentence is just like, these are the things that I am. And in order, by the way, right? So like, to me, like, I think mom is first, because like, that comes, that comes first for me. Um, Even though I love all the things I get to do in all the different areas, like, that's my first identifier. And I wanted to be real about that. I love, I always say human athlete, um, business person. Mm -hmm. And those are probably true at some point that might shake up, but my, um, human side, it's kind of like all personal world. Yeah. Uh, And then the, the, the athlete side has been so huge, but I just, I love that that you led with that. And, um, and how approachable it is because I, I just think the consumer people looking to achieve more really are looking for that before the ethos. But before we get into all the business and everything, I really want to hear about young Carol, like tell us about how you grew up. Cause I think okay, those are very indicative that like, those are early points of how the journey kind of shapes itself. So give us your young four one one. Oh my God. I love it. I wish I had like baby pictures right now for you. Um, <laughs> I feel like they're somewhere. I, they're somewhere. I tell you, even my kindergarten picture is like this. 
Like I think you posted like, it. <laughs> yeah. It's like smirky and cynical and kind of like, why am I in this bow? Like it's very, um, it's, <laughs> I'm already like overthinking things. So, uh, as a kid, I was, I was mostly loud and bossy, um, but also anxious and really wanted to get good grades and, um, be the good girl and do all the things right. Um, so I did that for a while. I also, and I, I feel like this is, this kind of changes you. There was like a, a period in like, uh, elementary school, you know, second, third, fourth grade where I was, you know, it was a rough spot. Like I was short and, um, had like, um, a permed bowl cut going on. And so it was not my best look. Uh, and I feel like it built a lot of character, you know? Um, and then, and then sports were always my thing, right? So like, um, I played basketball and soccer and cheerleading and, um, the field part of track and field wasn't always running. Wasn't my jam, but, um, I love that. And I, I felt like sports were such a, um, a way to even the playing field for everybody. You didn't have to be, you, know, you could just go out and have a good time. And so, um, that was kind of young Carol in a nutshell. Well, and so tell me like, were you, uh, brothers, sisters close with your yeah. parents? Were you guys like, super family yeah. oriented? Yeah. Yep. So, uh, my, my nuclear family was my mom, dad, and my older brother was a couple years older than me. And then, um, uh, my parents divorced when I was around seven and, and my mom got remarried. And so I ended up with a stepsister who was a month younger than me. So we were like very, you know, we were into all the same things for a long time and two stepbrothers. And then my, my older brother, and then my dad got remarried much later, but I ended up with a stepbrother and a stepsister there as well. Um, and that was like, you know, I always just wanted to do what my big brother was doing. So I learned a lot of stuff that I otherwise wouldn't have done. Like I played the piano and I played all the sports and I, I learned to like clean guns, like uh, things that I like would never <laughs> otherwise be interested in just because my brother was doing them or my brother was doing them with my dad. And I, I wanted to get in on that. You know, you got brothers, you know, you're yeah, friends. absolutely. Um, yeah. so that was my, that was a lot of it. And, um, and it was good. It was good for me because I got exposed to a lot of different stuff. I love, I, I didn't realize, I think we have talked about this before. I didn't realize the extended family had gone out so much like that. Those are pretty big, um, holiday bills if you're buying for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I hate compulsory gift giving, but, um, <laughs> Perfect. I could, I could talk a whole podcast on compulsory gift giving. Um, but <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, all my step families are great. I have, you know, my step parents are friggin' rad, like both That's of them. Awesome. Um, I think they make my parents better people. I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, you know, I'm glad that my parents did what's right for them. I know that, you know, people talk about divorce a lot as if like somebody died and I guess in a way a marriage did die, but the, but like what we got out of it, as far as bonus parents and, um, and step siblings, like that's pretty, you know, it's pretty amazing. And I think my, my, my parents are happier because of it. So I got really lucky that way. I, I completely agree. So my parents divorced when I was older. And I, I mean, we kind of saw, you know, the the cards were on the table as it was happening. So I wasn't super surprised. Yeah. But I talk a lot about Two American Tequila about having the tools and the skill set to get along with people and to communicate. And I, yeah. I echo your statements around sports. I think life skills through sports are so critical. It provides an equal space for everyone um, for the most part. And, you know, it, you can learn, you know, teamwork and commitment and so many things as a kiddo um, that can supplement your adult life. And communication is such a key piece of, you know, all those, those things. Do you feel like coming from, you know, a divorced family or, you know, now that we're X amount of years old, do you feel like your parents of that generation had the skills around communication that you do now? Uh, well, no, I don't. I, I, I firm no for my family. A firm no. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, no. <laughs> but I will say, like, one thing I appreciate about my parents is that they they have continued to grow too, right? So, you know, I have heard them ask, like, oh, I wonder if I could have done this better, and and maybe we could have been better here, and like, you know, of course that's true. Like, I don't know anybody who navigates divorce without something where you look back and think, like, oh, I. I did it perfectly, you know? Yeah. But, um, what I will say is I think like they, they loved us unconditionally and that I always knew. So even though we didn't have maybe all the communication skills to talk about it in the best way, or I can see like some patterns that played out, you know, seem so obvious now, but I knew that regardless, both my parents supported the other one's parenting, right? Like even when they were mad at each other, like they both said that the other parent was an amazing parent and they both loved us unconditionally. And that's like, I mean, what, you know, that's about as much as I thought that we could ask for at the time. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I'm always impressed. And I, I think regardless of what they did, I think our DNA, like we can show up and, and get education and get experience and travel and be amongst different humans. But like our, our core DNA of who you are, I mean, you have your physical, like actual genetics, but then you have, you know, nurture and nature, the environment you're in and how you're nurtured, um, the impact it and, and, you know, seeing that communication has been kind of a running theme in your life. I was curious mm-hmm. to know if like your parents did have a, you know, maybe not. Cause I think back in the day it was pretty hard. Like there wasn't a lot of conversation around intentional communication. Yeah. So if they were open minded and intentional with it at all. I think that's impressive and perhaps laid out some of the ground for you to be where you're at now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a big part of it. And I think, you know, the, even when people think of law and communication and, and coaching, even like it's so different to, to me, like so much of it actually comes back to how you're communicating little C communications, right? Not the big like PR, like whatever you think that goes into that, but those words matter, right? Even the words we say to ourselves matter. Mm -hmm. Um, and they matter a lot with what, you know, what we do with those and and our attitudes. And so I, I love like studying that, thinking about it. And it's been, you know, a big part of my life, even since then. At what point you talk about core values in your, um, in your binary side, I really appreciate it. That's something I was, I, I was unfortunate. My work was kind of health and wellness, human optimization. So I was kind of going through it while I was learning about it. And I didn't know. And I I was so thankful. It's like, you're going to brain map. You're going to do all this. And I was like, oh shit, well, I need this anyways. What a blessing. Um, when did you start to have conversations around core values and like really understanding Carol? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. And I I will say like, I just want to call this out really quick. I think one of the things that makes you such a special human KO is that like, since I met you, you have been like you, right? You are, you are unique and that like, it's, it attracts people to you, but there's like a genuineness about you that is so special that like, it's, um, it is, it's hard to like ever think you're faking it or doing, you know, like it's, Mm. it's kind of amazing. And so I think core values is really about getting at that. Like, what is it that is you, right? Like you just asked there, like, what is the core of Carol, um, versus something else? And I think, so to go back to the timeline question, I think the first time I did a core values exercise was probably, I don't know, maybe seven years ago or so. Okay. And I was, I was really lucky to be at Vail Resorts because that whole culture is focused on leadership development. And it's just like, it literally is the DNA of that company, right? It's like, it is, it is part of what you do when you work there, no matter what level you are, what department you're in. And, um, and so I was lucky enough to, to do an exercise as part of one of the programs. But the thing that I missed, and this is why I've done it multiple times since then, is that I almost, I wouldn't have known this at the time, but looking back, I think I was picking the core values I was supposed to have. Yeah. Right. Like, what are the things I'm supposed to write down? Like hard work, integrity, um, authenticity, like what, like what's the list that is like the thing I'm supposed to say? And I, of course, I never thought about it like that. But at the time I was still trying to be what I thought I was supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. So like what accolades can you get? What ladder can you climb? And so my core values probably match that. And now when, when I coach people on core values, I tell them like, nobody is testing you on these. So you can literally just put them in your computer or in on a post-it and you can be the only one that sees them. You don't have to prove to anybody but yourself that those are your core values. And so a lot of people will say something like, well, I, you know, when I looked at this list, I, I really connected with adventure, but like my life is really boring and, and that doesn't, that doesn't count. And I'm like, so F and what write it down because yeah. you know, you can use them as long as they feel true to you, you can use them to drive the decisions you make in your life. And then it just becomes more and more true. So that part that you read about identifying what you want to become, if you want to live in alignment with one of your core values being adventure, well, great. Let's figure out how to get you more adventure in your life. And so for me, like courage is a great example of that. I felt like I was living pretty safe. Um, I was doing all the things, not stepping out of line too much. And I really, but I value courage very much. I value not caring as much what other people think. I value trying things that you might fail at. You know, I value um, putting your neck out there and saying an opinion that might be unpopular. And so I was like, well, you know what, if I value that so highly, I'm going to put it here. And then I started to do things that are more courageous in my eyes. So, um, I think it can make a big difference. And that finally feels that list finally feels right for me. 
I love that. And I really appreciate your kind words. That means so much coming from you. Um, A, because you really do know me and you've seen us in fitness. You've seen like the good, the bad, the ugly, the drama. Uh, I mean, all of it. And um, it, it really means a lot. So don't make me tear up on minute 17. We have a long way to go, but I appreciate you. Um, well, and I, so I want to lean into these core values a little bit more because I would consider us both, you know, grounded, successful, blah, blah, blah women. But I still think core values gets overlooked, even when you've had the privilege to kind of unpack them and really understand why they're important but understanding yourself as cliche as it sounds like if I would have been my 18 year old self unpacking core values and be like what do I care about and I I really think things have worked out how they're supposed to the trajectory happened and I do stand for I I really can't fake it like if I don't want to do something I I don't show up and I wish I could control that but I'm also glad I can't because it just is what it is so you'll love it or hate it but I think well, I think if we were, you know, as, as young self being like, you really do care about the outdoors or freedom or whatever, yeah. I, I would have known very early on, I probably not going to have a boss. Like having a strict coach in college is going to be mm-hmm. a major learning experience for you. Like, wh- wh- how do you think that would have changed your trajectory if you were unpacking this at like your 18 year old self? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I don't totally know um, because I think that there was, if I was 18 and I, and I knew all these things about myself, cause I don't know if I'd have the same, if I had had yeah. the same trajectory. So what were they at 18? It, here's where I was at 18. <laughs> at 18, I was perfect on paper. I was valedictorian. I uh, had a secret hidden eating disorder. I um, could have gotten into a lot of schools. I played a lot of sports. Um, so I was like, out, you know, externally presented to the world, uh, you know, as perfectly as an 18 year old girl can. And internally, I, that's what I was focused on was perfectionism. Yeah. So I don't know if I would have even known who I was at that point. Right. Um, it took me a lot longer to figure that out. And um, yeah, sometimes I wish that as part of the reason I do this work, right. Can I, can I help people find, find their core faster so that mm-hmm. they don't spend a lot of their twenties trying to live up to some ideal that is not um, what they actually want to be in life. Well, I think you learn very quick. Even if you do check all those boxes and you're still unhappy, we're missing something. And then, yeah. I, then you get yeah. to the whole conversation of mental health. And it's like, I have everything, but I'm unfulfilled. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And it, it's, I don't want to make light of any of mental health in general, but I think if we get to some of these quote unquote, simpler conversations earlier, it might navigate around it. And I completely agree with you. I, I started the podcast because I wanted our young humans to, to question a better way. There's all this influence out there being blasted at them on social media, but there's also varsity humans that don't seek influencer status and they have all these incredible yeah. inspirational journeys. Um, yeah. And also you have to, and I want to like streamline some of their learnings, but I do think some things do just have to happen on time and you just have to pack yeah. a helmet. Yeah. And ready. Yeah. I mean, some of it's like, I feel so lucky that I was exposed to certain things when I was at all. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do I wish I could have moved some of that along faster? Sure. And do I, do I know that my journey would have been the same if I, if I had that? Nope. So yeah, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Exactly. I do always say, I'm like, I really wouldn't change a thing. And there's so many things that I look back and cringe or I'm like, what, what, why were you around those people? What were you doing? Or why don't you lean into X, Y, Z, but I really wouldn't change a thing. Totally. And he, I mean, here's the thing too, just going back to those, like, what, what do you pick and, and how, if anybody's like working on this right now, I mean, the other thing is like thinking about those values. If you feel like you should pick something as probably, it should probably come off your list, right? Like, and if you don't know if it's you or your conditioning or what you hear from your parents or social media or whatever, then like close your eyes and see how that word feels in your body. So if I say something like, I'll tell you this, like, hard work is something that used to be on my values list. And then after a while, when I was saying that, that phrase, I felt this like contraction in my chest, like, you know, back up. I worked hard enough for long enough. I don't want to keep working hard. And I had to like, really think about where that word came for, from, for me, why I thought it had to be in my list, what I want it to be instead. And so if you're not sure, listen to your body, because your body probably knows more, your intuition probably knows more than you think. And wait for a word that sounds like opening, that feels like a more of a relaxation in your body, because that means it probably is something that's truer for you now. And that other thing is probably something that was given to you or accepted by you or absorbed by you unintentionally. Yes. Amen. That conditioning is so hard to break. Even if you're experienced, educated, blah, 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 you have all this stuff. It's still hard to like really break through and let go. Um, and, and being, I think like competitive athletes, more is more harder is better. The worse it tastes, the healthier it is. Like the massage, the more beat up I walk out, like at, at, at this point, and I've kind of gone through this past two years of like, 
less is more. Like I'm fucking tired. I, <laughs> there's certain things I just don't give a shit about anymore. Like I, yeah. life doesn't always need to be a grind. And that was something that I yeah. was my familiar comfort zone, which is insane. Totally. And I, you know, I, some people call it hustle culture or, or whatever, but like you can call it whatever you want. But for me, so I, I kind of felt like, well, it's either hard work or, or I'm not doing anything. Right. And actually, no. So like, you know, I, that thought process it, for me was like, no, I work purposefully and intentionally, but I don't suffer for the goal of suffering. <laughs> that yeah. doesn't make, so, and you see that, I mean, I, I'm being a little dramatic about it, but you can see this in almost every corporate culture of like people bragging about bragging, right. About, Oh, I had to answer emails until 11 PM. And like, Oh, I'm so, so busy. I'm so busy. I'm busy. You know, it's, it's like, yeah. okay, but like, what, what do you value in that? And like, how, what are you teaching other people to value? And so that to me is like, I stopped saying that years ago, like just, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to ask for praise for that or compliments for that. Cause it's not what I value anymore, but it's hard to do it because it is kind of ingrained in us that yeah. how much time you spend on something and how, how much suffering it induces is actually its value. And that's not true at all. Yeah. Well, that is quite literally CrossFit. You realize <laughs> <laughs> and we're both longtime CrossFitters, but anyways, yes. <laughs> you remember had this great example of CrossFit though, when CrossFit started to get big, it was the short and intense mm -hmm. thing that worked, but is yes. it like when people started adding all that volume and taking away all their carbs, what happened? <laughs> right. Crash. You get all these people who were like totally overworked, who like suddenly couldn't make any gains. And now you're like, oh yeah, more is not more. It's, I just love it so much. Cause like I'm a fitness human, so I can make fun of us, but it's like the wealthy, smart, educated, beautiful humans that do the dumbest shit. And I'm like, why are we doing this? Like, stop, you know, you know, I mean, if you, even if you still follow the nutrition pyramid, you know, that this is the wrong way and you are, your adrenals failing your, I, so I think we actually, and we were probably like ambassadors. I'll speak for myself of the work hard, play harder, do your adrenals are so tired. You're falling asleep doing a box jump, but we're going to keep going. And I think it went, it went so hard. And then we kind of like, I think, oh, rest recovery is a thing. And I think that the, now the competitors are doing yeah. less, but like you just said, working smarter, which duh, yeah. we know this. Yep. Um, <laughs> how, how much do you, I love that you talk about the physical because I think everything yeah. like in corporate culture is quantifiable, like measurements and this. And like, what about just yeah. your energy and feeling? H have you, are you into like energy yeah. and intuitives or like, tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I, you know, a lot of times I try to ask, especially when I'm coaching somebody, because a lot of people will get in, especially overachievers, they get really cerebral about everything. Everything's in their head, logic, logic, logic. And I feel that like deep in my soul. I know that, but have you ever like woken up in the middle of the night and like, you can, you're awake and you can't go back to sleep and your logical brain can figure out how to get you there. And that the thing that you're worried about is fine, but you just can't do it. Right. And so there's these other pieces of us you know, our heart and our gut, or I will say like our emotional side and our intuition that come into that. Mm -hmm. And our bodies are so much smarter than we are. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, as an example, like for, for me, something that is, um, just kind of been part of what I've dealt with in, in my life is dealing with some extra anxiety, uh, particularly around achieving, or when I think something's going wrong. And I will, when I'm really in that space, like I will sometimes shake right? Like, like almost like imperceptibly, but I will kind of feel it like almost like a tremor. And I used to really hate that and be, be embarrassed by it. Like I wouldn't, you know, I would tell Jill, my wife about it or, um, or my dad, who's a doctor, but it didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense to me until I realized like our, our bodies actually are way more understanding and knowledgeable about what's going on with us than our brains are. And we don't give our bodies that credit. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, when like, instead of saying like, oh, I hate this anxiety and I'm embarrassed about it. I'll ask like, what is this trying to tell me? Like, what is, what is this, what is this yeah. bodily thing that's happening to me trying to share with me instead of like, oh, I hate you. And I'm embarrassed of you because we spend so much time controlling our bodies, whether that's with food or with exercise or, or, you know, um, medication to help us sleep and then to help us wake up or caffeine, you know, it could be anything. And, I, and I'm not hating on having anything that you need to survive because everybody's got to do what they need to survive. So I'm not saying that, but we spend a lot of time trying to like control our physical body. And, and sometimes we need to listen to it a little bit more too. Yeah. And so yeah. for me, you know, your body can really help you tap into your intuition 
and what's going on maybe below the level of consciousness. And I think for particularly for like super smart cerebral people, it's really hard for them to let go and do that. Yeah. I've, I've always joked that I hate smart people. I don't, but I'm a, my, all three of my brothers were always so much more cerebral and smarter than I was. And I, I had good grades. Like I was, I did well. I didn't, I like just cared about lacrosse and I was here to get all that done in next case. And I, I didn't like math. I was always like, I don't, I'm never going to use this. And I said this at like 18 before there was an app for trigonometry or whatever. Yeah. But, um, I, I do think there's something to that because it is so, oh, overcomplicated. And like, if, if you, even if you don't believe in the woo and intuition, which I love all of those things and the stars and yeah. whatever, but even if you just get as simple as like, when you say something, you don't feel good or you get around someone and you're like, I am yeah. so uncomfortable. Or I've really learned that when I stress, I, you know, bring my shoulders up and my like traps are like in my ears and they're sore the next day. I'm like, did I lift yesterday? And I'm like, it's like, no, you're stressed out. And you're so like yeah. clamped up, like just <sighs> like little yeah. tiny things. And it could be a very yeah. simple conversation. Are people... Uh, like, are people perceptive to that? Like, do they, do they do it? And can they make some changes around it? Or is that a pretty hard educational piece? Yeah, no, I think so. So sometimes like if somebody is like talking really fast at me or they're running in circles and ruminating, right. We'll just breathe for a few minutes and then see like where, whatever you're feeling. Cause sometimes you can't even name the emotion, right. Right. Resentment, guilt, fear, anger, you know, whatever it is, people can't even name it because they're not sure. They're not sure where to land in that rumination cycle. And so I'll just say, where do you feel it in your body? Where is it? Just close your eyes for a second. And then people, you know, because I think most people are in tune enough to say like, oh, I feel a tightness in my chest, or Mm -hmm. I feel a sinking in my belly, or I feel a restlessness in my legs. I'm like, okay, well, like, what do you think that feeling needs? Right. And I, I think people are more open to it than you might think, because the cynicism and the kind of like, oh, I'm too cool for that or whatever, that that tends to happen in groups. That tends to happen when there's other people who have that kind of like, oh, this would be, this would be too woo-woo for um, this business meeting. But I think in the one-on-one situation, it's a lot easier for people to say like, well, I might as well try. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be honest, I think that's like, sometimes the, the credibility or the background or whatever you want to call it, the like, you know, that, that got me here sometimes is like, okay, well, like if you're telling me this, maybe, maybe I'll try it. Like, because, you know, I'm not, I, I didn't just descend here from Venice beach and high and like, you know, like I, I'm like, <laughs> I wouldn't do this if I didn't think it meant something. Right. Right. Um, but we are so good at ignoring our emotions and ignoring the way our body feels that getting people to pause and acknowledge how their body feels and, and what emotions they're feeling instead of just immediately going to fixing it is really hard. And I, I think yeah. people don't usually have the space to do it. So in a, in a coaching relationship where that's literally the whole purpose of a lot of the time you have together, I think people are way more pers- like open and, and willing to do it than you might otherwise think. That's, uh, that's great to hear. And I, I think so. And I can only really speak from my own experience. And I want to talk a little bit about your experience personally, because I think that's what makes you a great coach. Like I played lacrosse for 25 years and then I competed in this and that really helps me. Like I had ethos in it. I had, I was a good coach because I played and then a multitude of other things, yeah. but it, your experience I think is really critical. And I think people see if you've done it authentically, or if you Googled coaching on the way to the appointment, um, I think they'll see through it. But when you get into it, when I was like first getting to like pause and sit still, if you've denied it your entire life and all of a sudden you hold still and you feel it and it's like, I mean, I've had tears all of a sudden, I don't know where they're coming from, or you feel lonely or scared or really happy. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a hard space to be in and to hold and feel it the first time. Um, Can you tell me like some personal breakthroughs you've had on that journey? Uh Yep. So I'm totally with you on that. And I will say years ago, way before I ever started coaching, I avoided yoga because I'd get into yoga, you know, for stretching and like for whatever. And then we get into Shavasana and I'd be like crying. I'm Mm -hmm. like, wait, what, why is this happening? And I had no idea what was wrong, why I was crying. Like I had, I had no clue. And I was like, well, instead of saying like, I should listen to that. My first thought was I better not go to yoga again. That's terrible. (laughs) (laughs) How crazy is that? (laughs) So, So that's like, I was like, okay. So, and then eventually when, when I went to look for my own coach. And here's a couple pointers. If your coach doesn't have a coach, don't hire them. Love it. Right. Because like, this is, this is not about me knowing more than the person I'm coaching. That's bullshit, right? Like everybody needs another human to sit outside of their brain and help them see what their brain is doing to them. The lies it's telling them the things that it's maybe interpreting incorrectly, 
the limiting beliefs it has. Um, everybody needs that. And so it is not, coaching is not like, a, I know more than you, let me tell you how to do it. That's, that's not it. Um, and so when I first went looking for a coach, I wanted somebody who could help me tap into that kind of that intuition. Like I knew eventually yeah. that like I needed to learn how to be more mindful. So I searched out a coach that specialized in mindfulness. And even though most coaches have the same basic skill set, finding someone who focuses on whatever it is that you're trying to bring more of into your life is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I started working with my coach, her name is Melissa Mayer. She's amazing. She has San Francisco. Love her. There's a little plug for Melissa. I, you know, we would do that. Like I would do the thing that I'm talking about. I ramble, 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 you know, ruminating, ruminating. These are all the things that are terrible. And she would say, okay. And she would listen patiently. And then she would make me stop and breathe. And sometimes that meant I was laying on the ground in a park crying. <laughs> and sometimes that meant I was just walking and listening to my feet. Right. Um, and sometimes that meant I was just practicing sitting with the heart emotion. Like mm -hmm. I remember one time I was saying, well, you know, I was trying to avoid an emotion and she was like, what is the worst thing? And I said, well, that's embarrassment. I don't want to feel embarrassed. And then we kept going down this road of like, okay, what happens if you feel embarrassed? And it was like, oh, like, I guess I don't die. Like, but it took yeah. so much for me to get there. And so working with somebody who could help me be mindful in the sense of being able to recognize my emotions and be with them without judgment and separate myself from the thoughts I was having and the emotions I was having, that was really helpful for me. So I believe in this stuff and I believe yeah. everybody needs it or could benefit from it. I don't think we need it, but we could all benefit from it. And so I, yeah, I've had a, a lot of personal breakthroughs on that front or I wouldn't do it, honestly. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I just think it's so important. I consider it a luxury. Like if you have the opportunity to sit down and really get to know yourself and unpack pieces of the puzzle, it's critical. And it's just like as an athlete, you would never go into any professional situation and not have a varsity ass coach and a nutrition coach and yeah. an athletic coach and an offense and defense. Yeah. Like the, the better, totally. the, it's just like sports. So I don't know why it's still kind of like this unaccepted or judged situation to have like a life coach or yeah. personal coach or whatever. It, when in every other aspect of life, we do it. If you want to be a chef, if you yeah. want to be it, you get a coach. So totally. it's critical. And anytime I've unpacked something really heavy, that's like kind of drags me through it. And I'm like energetically hung over or whatever it's then you unpack. And I was like, well, shit, it wasn't that bad. Like, I'm so glad yeah. I didn't carry that for the next 20 years and you just move on. So like, do you feel right. like you get better at it? Yeah, totally. I mean, actually when I, when I started coaching, like when I was in the training program, I didn't even realize that I carried this belief around it, which was that I, I had to be a subject matter expert with it, right. Or with whatever the person was dealing with. And I think particularly starting in law, like you're literally a subject matter expert on the law. So, you know, getting away from that and saying, I don't, yeah, like I don't have to be a subject matter expert on what you're dealing with, with your teenage daughter. Right. I just have to be a, a, a professional in what I do and ask you the right questions to help you find the answers. I am not your answer. You have your own answers inside you my job is to help you find them. And so that's like, it's a switch. And it yeah. took me a while not to like run away and think like, well, let me go find the answer for my client. You know, <laughs> that's, that's your, not, tumor, that's like, that's your turmeric and tequila. <laughs> like literally it's opposites. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's very different. It's very different. And, um, it's a great skill to learn and it's a lot to let go if you're used to being a subject matter expert and maybe a control freak. Well, I think the beautiful through line in that is that you did exist that way. I think it's brought you full circle to your authentic self, but the good news now is you can reach all the people that are your fellow lawyers, your fellow controllers, yeah. which I really think are most humans. So you perfectly identify with probably the humans, I hate to say it, but that need it the most. I, I agree with you that I think we all really do. Um, and it's a luxury if you have that opportunity, but I, I, it's, it's just, I think it's so serendipitous that that was your previous path. And now you can deeply speak to anyone that identifies with that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I think I think it's a little bit unique too, right? To to have gone through that and then come out here. And it's one thing like now I, I'm I'm trying to be careful not to just speak to the choir, like the people who've gone through this and are here and are like totally believe in it. And a lot of coaches end up selling to other coaches, mm -hmm. right? Because they're like they're already bought in. They already believe in this. And so, and that's great, but that's not actually who I want to reach. So um I have to remember to keep going back to that the situation I was in and, and how I felt and that, and making sure that I'm using language and being accessible to, to those folks. I love it. And I, and I want to get your opinion on this because when I was 
in it myself as a competitor or business person or whatever, and then managing quote unquote influencers, I saw, so we're kind of in our circle of like CrossFitters or high achievers or however you label it. It's a, we're similar like-minded humans. And then you get out into the masses and again, not better or worse, just straight up different. It's, it's a, oh wait, your reality isn't like mine. And the same thing they probably say about us or someone that's not like them in any capacity. And you have to like get out of your circle and understand that your little world are probably people like you and you have to continuously work to understand, empathize and uh, have an awareness around the community that wasn't around you. And I saw that when I was managing influencers and I saw the people that showed up, I'm like, oh wait, these aren't fellow CrossFitters. These are people that probably have never worked out in their life. Even though it's a fitness person, it's a totally different demographic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's huge. I mean, going back to way all the way back to the core values discussion. One of the reasons I love that is you realize like you don't have the same values as everybody else. I mean, that's part of the point, right? It's mm-hmm. like my values might be different than some influencers values who, who is like, you know, trying to get folks to like get their first steps in, right? Like, like that's, that's different. We might have different things. So the way we sell and the way we talk to people and the way we go about whatever we're doing might be totally different. And that's actually beautiful. Like we don't all mm-hmm. have to agree. Like we don't all have to have the same values and we can release a lot of judgment and a lot of perfectionism if we just stop trying to get everybody else to see the world the way we do. Yes. Right. And yes. so that is, that's like, that's a huge piece. I think of coaching too, is, is trying to get to as much non-judgment as you can. Yeah. Um, Cause of course we all naturally judge people, but that is, it's been a great lesson from that work of like, this is actually not, this is not about becoming the ideal or doing the ideal thing there is no ideal right. like there's only ideal for you and what you want and so once you release that from other people you've also released it from yourself right when you give up the idea that you have to be perfect you let other people not be perfect too and so seeing that in in that world is so unique because you're like oh there's there's like so much more variety and possibility in the world when we let go of things happening the way we think they should happen Yes. Oh, that conditioning it is cardio, but it, it, it's true. If you've ever been on a team and you see, like, I loved one of the best things I ever did was leave home and I love my home, but go away to college. And I see, I mean, we're still all basic white girls that play lacrosse. My team was a minimally diversified for lacrosse. It was pretty good, but we had, um, I think a few people of color, but it's still pretty similar. But even then I was from you know, Colorado. They were mostly from East coast. And just in that experience, me seeing how they live, how they drive to practice, how they pack yeah. their stuff up, but how their families cook. Like it was so cool that we were so yeah. different. So then we both walked away way with like, I say my varsity pro life tips where, no, this is how you do this. And it's like little stuff, let alone you get to that deeper level of like, oh, you're actually learning from one another. Like, thank God we're not the same. Yeah. Yeah. No, so true. And I think that a lot of times, you know, it goes the other way too. Like if you catch yourself judging something that somebody else is doing, it's probably something you judge yourself for in some way. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, um, it's really, if you're, if you're looking for where perfectionism shows up in your life, that's a great place to start is wondering how, like when you catch yourself pointing fingers or, or doing something at somebody else, it is probably something that you aren't sure about in your own life or in your own internal world. And that's something to pay real attention to. Yes. That can be one of the hardest things to like fully comprehend and be like, no, I'm nothing like that. Da, da, da. And then the, the further you dig mm-hmm. into it, it's like, actually, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, a, totally. it's a tough point. I, I want to read this quote specifically around um, high performance and contributing, but I really like this is also on your site. One of my favorite quotes is by Benjamin Franklin and, and it says, I'd rather it be said he lived usefully than died rich. Because I think mm-hmm. in, in our hearts, we really do want to contribute in some capacity. And this is a quote you have posted. It says, the science shows that the secret to high performance isn't our biological drive or our reward and punishment drive, but our third drive, our deep seated desire to direct our own lives, to extend and expand our abilities and to make a contribution. Daniel Pink. Tell me a little bit about that means to you. Yeah. So I think, especially in, in upper management, one of the reasons I put that on there is because I think we think that we all act commercially rationally, right? So we're all just like here to make one more dollar than we would have if we did something else. And I don't know where that sunk into the collective consciousness, but it's just not true. That's not what motivates people. And most of us want to feel a sense of purpose and a sense of autonomy, right? Which is what which is what the whole point of that book drive is about purpose, autonomy, and mastery, right? Those are three things that we feel that actually do motivate us intrinsically, not just extrinsically, which is how people usually try to motivate other people. 
you know, do this act and you'll get this bonus or do this and, and you'll be accepted by more people, right? But if we can focus instead on what is it that we want to get really good at and what is it that we feel connects us to a bigger purpose, now we have motivated ourselves. And that is that that is something we can live for, for for life. And it doesn't have to be one thing. This is the other piece of that is that I I do, I don't say like, go find your passion and go do that or find your one purpose because as somebody who's had like five careers at this point, I don't always <laughs> think that's true. I think you can have multiple passions. I think you can be interested in multiple things and be good at multiple things. One of my other favorite books, I'll show it because I know we're going to be on YouTube, is Range, which is all about real, like spreading your interest across things and not just being a subject matter expert on one or two. And so I think your purpose can be much broader than what we typically think of with that. Um, so I think that that to me is how how we should motivate each other and ourselves is helping us find what it is that makes us feel purposeful instead of trying to figure out what end of the road extrinsic benefit of money or looking a certain way or acceptance from other people that we're usually chasing. I love it so much. And I will just add a quick tidbit. When you do diversify your quote unquote portfolio in life, just like in sports, go play everything. I tell this to my kiddos that are specializing. Like by the time they're 11, it's like, go put, you're going to be sick of it by the time you earn a scholarship. When you do different things, you meet different people. And that's when you get yeah. to see other cultures, other ways of approaching things. Other, Like I think that, that getting to cultivate these different relationships with really different people from different situations is the gold. Like that's yeah. the real education. Yeah. And it's actually, I mean, one of the arguments that David Epstein makes in that book is that that's actually the skill that we really need as things become more automated is we need less people to do repeatable activities and more people to be able to pull similarities from different situations and be able to find patterns and truly critically think about what could make our future better. And so that to me is like, that's also the fun in it, right? So like seeing in one, one area and then being like, Hey, I know this is weird, but this is a lot like rugby, even though I'm sitting in a boardroom in a public company, right? It's very like, but actually I think that there's some great, there's some great lessons there. And I will tell you this, yeah. I, at, um, I, this is years ago now, but at, at Vail Resorts, I told you there was a very big leadership culture. And in one of my first um, meetings with all of the lawyers there, we had to, each, each lawyer uh, at a different meeting had to bring an article that they thought spoke to leadership. And um, we had great articles from HBR and Inc. and, you know, um, whatever fancy academic publication we had. And at the time, our general counsel, who was my boss's boss at the time, was um, Fiona Arnold, who is a badass Australian woman who does real estate now in Denver, and she's the most awesome. But anyway, the article I brought was with a rugby coach. It was an interview with a rugby coach. And um, it was called How to Win by Jack Clark. uh, And he had been interviewed um, by by somebody in the rugby community. But I just loved how he talked about leadership. And I thought, well, whatever, everybody's got these academic articles. But a lot of people connected with it. Yeah, because there are similarities, and it does overlap. And it's so it can be so motivating to see things that happen in other industries or other contexts that you can apply directly to whatever context you're in. Um, And it can really connect dots for people, I think. I love it so much. And I love, this is why I love my fellow fitness humans. Uh, how many people in the room that brought those like academic articles, not to throw shade at them, but how many of them do you think felt pressure to bring something from something super smart? Oh. So they, so, so I love that you brought something that was like athletic and they're probably like Googling what rugby is. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, so, it's so true. And actually, I mean, the other thing going to the non-judgment, the coach that it's about is like kind of a controversial figure in rugby. Oh, okay. Right. Yes. Um, so it wasn't like I was saying like, oh, he's the epitome of leadership, but a lot of things he talked about, right? Like um, he had these like five rules that they listed out in the interview. And one of them was love conditionally, right? Like this is the high performance culture. And so it, this is not family, like family is unconditional. And he even mm-hmm. made this joke, like my, my, like, you know, deadbeat brother down in Huntington beach, like <laughs> I don't want him on my team, but I love him unconditionally. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, another one was expect everyone to lead, like whether you're a freshman or a senior or the best on the team or the worst on the team, like you can show up on time, you can encourage your teammates, you can speak respectfully to the ref. Like there's a lot of things that you can do to lead, even if you're not in a position of higher rank. And so I've used that time and time again. And like, I'm so glad. And in fact, I give Fiona credit for this because 
Fiona liked it so much. She sent it to the CEO at the time, which is like a baby lawyer that made me feel so seen and appreciated and like, oh, I'm in the right place. If this is get like, if this gets traction. So, and I didn't have to show up with the fancy HBR article that everybody already read. Yes. I love it. My, my, my graceful disruptors all the days it's, it, it starts so early on. Uh, well, and the other thing that I think sports really provides is like, like you were saying that that failure early on. So I think you get better and better at failing. So if you get like kicked yeah. in the face at soccer, whatever, if you bring like a not socially acceptable article, it's kind of like, okay, well, whatever, yeah. like <laughs> I know, it's fine. Everybody will be like, Carol, you know, <laughs> they're not coming to my birthday party, whatever. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, totally. I just wanted something different. Yeah, no, I, I think that's huge. And on the flip side, people actually like understood it and yeah. it resonated. So yeah, yep. lean into it. Um, yeah. I, I really want to hear, I want to be mindful of our time. So I want to make sure yeah. we get a ton in about the coaching, but can you give me a little piece of, you know, coming from resorts and then USA yeah. Gymnastics and, you know, a little piece from each of those where you learn the most and then what of those two things or a few things of your professional experience really inspired yeah. you to take the leap to do your own coaching business? Yeah, well, so I'll start there because they're connected. So when I, when I was in the legal department at Vail Resorts, I love that company, but I, I started to get about five years in, I was just getting itchy. Like I wanted to learn something new, do something different. And um, Rob Katz, who is the CEO there, posted a position for something called the Director of Executive Projects. It was a new role. And it was basically for a director level to report directly to the CEO and kind of be his right-hand person. And uh, I, I raised my hand for that. I was scared to death and I got it. And I spent two years we changed the title later to chief of staff. I spent two years being chief of staff um, for Rob. And it was one of the most unique experiences I think anybody could ever have. And, you know, part of that is um, Rob is a, is a unique, wonderful leader, but also he just took his role as a, as a leader in a one-on-one -on -one context. So seriously that I felt like my development was one of his top priorities. I felt like you know, my understanding of the dynamics that were going on was a top priority. And then he didn't give me the answers, which was maddening at the time. Like it drove me crazy, but he really coached me as much as you can, you know, truly coach a direct report into finding out the insights for myself. And I thought when I went from that to leading a team of, you know, 25, 30 people, I thought like, I got to figure out how you get that skill set. And and I didn't know how to do it because it was really unique. I had not had that from leaders before. And so I started looking into coaching programs, professional coaching programs. And then I started training, which for me, since I had a very demanding full-time job, you know, took over a year to get fully trained and get all my practice hours in. And once I did that, like I mentioned earlier, it was not like the most natural thing in the world to me for that. It was, it was Hi, definitely baby. hard. Sorry, my little, my puppy. Um, it was definitely hard. And so I, I had to, I wanted to keep those skills up. So I kept coaching even after I left Vail Resorts um, and just kind of did it as something on nights and weekends, not a lot of hours, but enough to keep up the skills for myself. And so I did that. Um, and I did that while I was at USA Gymnastics too, but that was a very demanding job. So I also couldn't do it like, you know, constantly. I, I really just had to keep a couple hours to do that but I really wanted to, cause I was passionate about it. And then when I moved to, to USA gymnastics, um, I, you know, it, it was definitely a, a newer culture. It was something that, um, you know, a lot of the folks there are new, um, from in the last few years. And so it was kind of all hands on deck for everything we needed to, to get done. And so, you know, for me, that was, I think the biggest lesson there is there's so much scrutiny from the outside um, on that organization. And I feel like what was really true is that everybody that I worked with was heads down on let's do the right thing now. Yeah. And we're going to put all our effort and focus into that. And we're going to make mistakes and we're going to mess up, but the ultimate goal is more important than, you know, fixing the, the external stuff right now. And, and that to me was, was huge. I feel like everybody that I got to work with there was fully committed to, making a change for the athletes in gymnastics. And so, you know, um, it was, a it was definitely a kind of, uh, everybody was involved in that, in that ultimate goal. And I think when you have that kind of mission that people can rally around, people can do superhuman things. Right. Yeah. Um, and so this is pretty amazing to see that start to come back, right. And changes be made and the, and the progress in the culture. And so, um, I love that. 
and it's it is really hard it's taxing and it's a it's a difficult situation for any human to be in and so um you know for me i i really i was still kind of had this coaching lens and i loved it and there was one moment where i was exhausted from um from a, a trip and i did a lot of traveling for work where i had a coaching client and the next day after i got home which was like a saturday or sunday so it was a weekend and i was like i can't believe i'm coaching tomorrow and then I got done with my coaching call and I was energized. I felt like I could jump up the walls. I was like writing up my notes and going to look stuff up for the client. And I was like, well, this kind of tells me something about like where I feel really pulled right now. Um, and so I kind of couldn't ignore that any longer. And to be totally honest, like one of my kind of limiting beliefs was that I I'm really good at excelling in, in like school and the corporate world. And I can do that. But like this entrepreneurial thing, well, no, that's, I couldn't do that. <laughs> right. So it's something that I've had to work through a lot of like, well, that's bullshit. That's something I've told myself to keep myself safe and not have to try or risk failure or risk putting myself out there. And once I was presented with that information with coaches and friends and people who love me saying like, this is your fear talking. I chose courage and I decided to go for it. And so that's how I ended up here now. I love it. I've seen so many of um, my varsity humans that thrive in the corporate world, take the leap. And it's not even shade to the corporate world because I think personality wise, some people it really works yeah. for, but I also think you can evolve out of it or evolve into yeah. it. As yeah. an entrepreneur, you, it's very, and having dabbled in the corporate world a little bit, it, it can be cushy and it can yeah. supplement your life depending on where you're at and whatnot. Um, but I always got to give uh, an extra shout out to all my fellow entrepreneurs because it's really hard. And so much of it, even if you get the right team around you, you're doing it yourself. You really, yeah. really are. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's funny. Cause when you, when you talked about just even like the about me section is like, Oh, this, I'm not writing like about us for whatever organization I'm working for. Like I'm literally writing, this is me as a human. And so it's not spin. It's not, you know, you have to just see like, is this how I truly feel on the inside? And is that coming out in these words? And that is very different when that, when you're talking about yourself as a human, um, and not, you know, candidly, I don't think of it as a brand. I yeah. know that like all my, all the background that I have would say to do it that way. And I don't, um, yeah. Like I, it's fine to do that. I'm not no judgment on that. But for me, it was like I'm putting out my my human self in this role, and that's what I want to talk about here. So um, that was that was intimidating. And I do think I I totally agree with you. No shade at all to the corporate world because I I learned so much from mm -hmm. that, and I love it. And I think for me, it was an evolution. All the changes I made in my career from from law to chief of staff to comms to this, none of it has been because I hated the last thing. Right. It's all been like, Hey, where is, where is my head and my heart getting pulled next? I love that. Um, I think I, again, we could be intentional, but I think I always say universe, God, Madonna, whatever you believe it is kind of setting you up for your trajectory, even more intentional. We're going to class and we're working out or whatever. Some yeah. things are just unfolding exactly how yeah. they need to be. And that's still kind of hard for me to grasp. Cause it's like, wait, I got to do what I, I, Can I force everything, please. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so tell me about like your ideal client. Like why is your coaching mm -hmm. practice so important to you and why is it different and or similar yeah. to other coaching opportunities? Yeah. So moment of real vulnerability here. Cause I will tell you, I, when I first started coaching, what I really wanted to do was help like the, the people in the same position that I was maybe five or 10 years ago, people who are doing really great on paper, but maybe have lost a sense of self or, um, are, are coming into something new or have tied up their self-worth and their accomplishments. And I still love helping that person. So don't get me wrong. But one thing as an example that I was, was, I was wrong about is I thought I was going to coach mostly women. And now I have a couple male clients and I love it. So for me, I think that there's like what, what I really love helping any human focus on is who, not what have they done in the past and how does that not match up to what they're doing now, but more of who do you want to become? Whether that's as a leader, as a parent, as a friend, as a whole human in your life, you know, where do you want to, where do you want to get to and how can I help you get there? And so that's why like it's a little, I'm a little different from some coaches because I kept this on, I kept my strategic communications work as part of the services that I provide. And that's because I think that is, it's very similar for whole organizations, mm -hmm. which is 
don't stop thinking about like all the stuff you have to get over from the past and think more about what do you want to be as an organization in the future? And how do you st start building all the proof points to create that truth? Because that's the same thing we do in coaching humans is if you want to be um, a you know, mid-level leader with great work-life balance who exercises every day and has, you know, time to read on the weekends. Cool. Let's start making that true. I don't, I don't care as much about where you are right now, except to figure out how we're going to get you to where you want to be. And then for some people, it's figuring out where is it? Cause they don't even know where they want to be because they haven't been in touch with who they are in a very long time. And, I, and honestly, that can take shape in mid-level leaders uh, C-suite executives, lawyers, like that is not, you know, it, it is, it is not boxed to a certain rung on the ladder. Everybody has those feelings. And so I really think like people who are having some, some kind of what we usually call a crisis of identity or, um, or a, a certain space in life, maybe like to me, those are not crises. Those are opportunities. And I, I want to help people see it that way. I love that. So well said. When people ever ask me about coaching, I'm not a personal coach, um, long time athlete coach and whatnot, but I, I think there is a lot of similarities, but kudos to all the additional coaching education you've taken on and sharing your life experience. Cause to me, like the personal ethos is what sells me on getting a good coach. Like when I walk yeah. in the fitness room and like, I can tell you do yoga and you're teaching CrossFit, I'm just like, I'm not going to buy in. Like I just won't. So, um, that's why I really wanted to dig into like your back because I, I know you and I know how in depth you are about, um, coaching, learning, continuing to evolve and continue to be open. I think that's, you know, where people can really meet you at that whole space and then be super vulnerable. Um, I know you kind of specifically talked to it, but I, I almost want to water it down to anyone that's into coaching. It's, I, I would just simply say, you're just looking to, to do something else or dial something in like really, really simple. And you want to make that shift. You just don't know how. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Actually. Can I just use that for hundred percent? I'll invoice cool. you accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just it's kidding. So true. It's, I mean, it's hard because I think, you know, from a, from a marketing and branding standpoint, they, they say like in the coaching world, like yeah. have your niche dial it in. And it's like, well, listen, like I, I just started like, cause for a while, like, let me tell you, I would coach anybody you wanted to coach. Yeah. I'm like, you want some coaching? Let me coach you. Cause I wanted to get good at the skills. Right. And I don't want to just be able to like do, you know, do one kind of coaching. I want to be able to do different kinds of coaching. And so for me, like, I think I don't want to choose a niche too early because I'm fine. I'm learning about myself. So I want the humility and the openness to say like, yeah, this is who I thought I really wanted to work with. And that's great. But I'm also learning a lot about coaching by working with these other populations. Right. Yes. And so to me, that's like, yeah, right now I am, I'm doing what you said. Cause I love that. Thank you. Let's go with that. <laughs> um, it's all yours. I, I promise. I, I'm just, I'm not specializing too early because it's something that has helped me learn a lot about what I like. Yeah. Um, and who I can help the most. I love it. And I was a branding professional. And I, again, I make fun of my branding community, just like my fitness community, because we're hilarious and out of control. But um, I, I think that you you don't need to like brand. I think, again, going back to the woo, if you just get your energy right, you're clear on yeah. you, the community will find you. It will come. And no one wants to hear yeah. that in business. Like do less, just get your shit right. No one wants to hear that. They're like, what are your trajectories? Uh -huh. What's your sphere? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, I'm just going to tell you the woo. And most people again don't want to hear it. But Get yeah. your shit together. I almost want to call this cast. I never label them before our conversation, but I think I want to call it um, leading yourself to lead others. And I don't even think that makes sense, uh, ooh, but I really, yeah. I, I really think it is like you have to have that journey in order to kind of shape anyone else. But man, there's so much gold within that when you're in your trial yeah. error phase. Yeah, I think that's totally true. And that's what, it, I mean, that's really what it is, right? Like that is what leadership is. You have to start with yourself. Yeah. Right. Yes. And it's not about, even when we were talking about coaching, it's like, you, you gotta be your own best client. And by that, I mean, like, don't sell somebody an activity that you wouldn't do. If you're telling somebody to journal every, every morning, get your ass up and journal every morning, because like you can't create or help people create breakthroughs for themselves that you're not willing to do for you. Because even if it doesn't, you don't think it'll matter to them, or you would never tell them about your journaling or whatever, people will sense that inauthenticity and they will, and they will know that something's off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's such an important part of, of any leadership or coaching or anything else is, is being able to walk the walk and be your own best client. 
if all humans could just do that, shall yeah. shall we reach to be so great? Um, tell do you have anyone we could go on, but I, I do want to be mindful of your time. Um, we didn't even get into her fabulous wife, Jill, who's an Olympian, her kiddo August, the dogs that are running around, like full on family human. I mean, yeah. it's literally a, a household of, of varsity bosses. But do you have any good piece of advice, professional or personal, whatever, to anyone out there that's looking to make a change? I have so many pieces of advice to say hey, no, one is I would say I am going to make it more than one. Follow your heart. Listen, listen to your intuition and your body. If something feels wrong, something's wrong. And it doesn't mean that you did anything wrong, but it does mean that you can tune in and listen to yourself. And the second piece is slow down to speed up, right? Slow is fast. And by that, I mean, a lot of times we start looking for the next thing. So I don't like my job. Well, I'm going to go find another job or I don't like my relationship. So I'm going to go find another one. And wherever you go, there you are. So get yourself right on the inside and work on you before you try to bring yourself the feelings that you want from external circumstances. So before you go trying to get that new job or new relationship or new car or promotion, because you think that's going to make you happy, slow down and spend a moment to think about what truly makes you happy and what you can do in your internal world to support that. Because a lot of times we want that external piece, but you can bring a lot more to yourself than you think you can, but you got to slow down to do it. Amen. This is, I love these casts because I obviously do it for the universe or whatever, but they're always good for me. Like I get so much out of these conversations. <laughs> it's really just about me. I'm just kidding. And I love smart people. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you. It's so great. I know. I I'll let you run. We got to catch up IRL in real life. Um, but Carol, where do we find you? Give me website and yeah. of course put it out there, but hit me with details. Yep. Uh so you can find me at carolfabriziocoaching.com. Super fancy branding, obviously. Um, so and then and then my LinkedIn is actually where I spend the most time. I'm also uh on Instagram, but that's mostly for personal stuff. Um, so find me on LinkedIn or on my website and yeah, I'd love to to hear from you. Boom. Well, you have my warm endorsement. I've known this human for a very long time and competed alongside her, um, have partied with her. Like this is a human you really do want in your world. So if you're looking to fine tune the edges or get the edges sharper or what have you, go check out your girl, Carol. She shall uh, make you laugh and make you uh, varsity up. Thanks, Carol. This has been awesome. Thank you Thanks, for having me. I, I appreciate you. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time and don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen.